Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, today, we are going to have like a little bit of a war warm up to our upcoming matchmaking meetings with the Brazilian corporates. And we have the honor to have Jack Compausen from the Embassy of Sweden in Brasilia, who will go into talk about the strategic bilateral uh, cooperation between Sweden and Brazil. And then we will have, sorry. <laughs> And then we will have Andreas Rentner from Business Sweden in Brazil, who's going to introduce us to how you make business in Brazil. So, okay, Jakob, you can start. You have to unmute, Jakob. Yeah, I am unmuted now, I guess. Okay. So, can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. then I will start then. Okay. Um, good afternoon to all of you from uh, Sweden and good morning to you uh, participating from Brazil. As you know, we have a, a five hour time difference. So it's a morning now here in Brazil. Uh, my name is uh, Jakob Silva Paulsen, and uh, I am Innovation and Science Counselor at the Swedish Embassy in Brazil, in Brasilia. Uh, I first want to uh, thank Ignite and SIF for the invitation to talk a little bit about the strategic cooperation of innovation between Sweden and Brazil, and uh, also present our office to tell a little about what we do and, uh, and how we can help. Um, Next slide here. Um, uh, <clears throat> we are um, a part of what uh, you call Team Sweden Brazil, um, where we also have Business Sweden, uh, who will do the presentation after me. So just tell a little bit uh, about the context who we are. Uh, the Team Sweden uh, consists of the embassy, uh, our innovation office, uh, where I work, uh, the consulate, uh, Business Sweden, Swedish Chamber of Commerce and uh, CISP, uh, the Sweden Brazil Research and Innovation Center. Uh, we do have different tasks and uh, target groups, but uh, in several cases we work with the same actors and uh, with an angle of uh, innovation. Uh, as an example, I can mention the EIT, what we call the Executive uh, Innovation Team Brazil, which uh, or more or less 10 large uh, Swedish companies in Brazil, uh, where we have a transversal dialogue between Team Sweden and uh, these companies because we have different action with them. Also, uh, I can mention we have the yearly innovation weeks where the whole Team Sweden works together, uh, both with the uh, individual and but also with the common events and all that are coordinated by uh, the Swedish uh, embassy. Uh, this year, of course, um, We'll see how it goes. We still can have our physical meeting or we have to do everything web-based. But uh, in any case, it will be in uh, November here in, uh, in Brazil. Okay, so a little bit more about uh, who I am and uh, what we do. Uh, I work with the Swedish Minister of uh, Enterprise and Innovation. So uh, we are located at the embassy, but I'm, I'm not... I'm not working for the Ministry of uh, Foreign Relations, but from the, the Ministry of uh, Enterprise and Innovation or Nang's department in, in Swedish. Uh, they have six innovation offices spread out in the world on places considered of uh, strategic, uh, special strategic importance for Sweden. And uh, the overall goal with this office is to improve, improve and, and broaden the communication between the, the innovation ecosystems in the two countries. As well as uh, we also work, work not only with innovation, but also with uh, research and uh, higher education. We have four offices in Asia. We have one in, uh, in Japan, South Korea, India, and China, as well as two in the Americas. We have one office in Washington, DC, and then we have uh, one here in uh, Brazil, in the capital, Brasilia. And uh, each office have a director, normally sent off from Sweden as a head of the office. 
and one or more local employees with a scientific profile, normally with a PhD or, or likewise. Uh, I am uh, head of the office here in Brasilia, and I have uh, Anna Carolina or Carol. Um, she has also a PhD as a, and a very broad background uh, in science and uh, innovation. And she's helping me mapping the Brazilian ecosystem for research, uh, innovation, and higher education. Uh, we also have, a, as you can see the address here, we have a blog where we post like two to three times per month. And our next post on Wednesday will actually be about uh, the matchmaking event between uh, CISP and Ignite. So I will recommend you go in and uh, look at that. I guess all those slides will be available for you afterwards also. So you can, uh, you can see, you can have the address. So um, what we, we do at the office is uh, we have uh, mainly uh, four areas of work. Uh, most uh, important and uh, resource demanding uh, for us is the gathering of uh, in intelligence and the mapping of the infrastructure of, of research and innovation, mostly in Brazil, but also in Sweden. Uh, so uh, we have to use a lot of efforts to, to do this mapping. Um, uh, we do, of course, also disseminate our information and knowledge in uh, different events to, to help the true ecosystem to meet. That's a kind of the objective. And this uh, does, of course, also include uh, matchmaking and uh, door opening. Mostly uh, actors in Sweden as, uh, who are looking for cooperation in, uh, and opportunities in Brazil. So we help often to take the first step and, and uh, see who to talk to. And uh, also, if we do not know the right person or organization, we normally know who can help to find the right contact. Uh, and finally, uh, we are also uh, research and innovation ambassadors uh, being in, involved in our bilateral cooperation of innovation, uh, on innovation, government to government, and uh, that you can see on the next slide. So here you can see we have, uh, since a while, uh, a bilateral cooperation on innovation. Uh, it has step by step uh, been growing the first uh, agreement was in 1984 and then we have a new one 2009 and then 2015 and so on but um, um, in 2015 uh, the high level group of aeronautics was created and uh, the, we have today a very good and well structured cooperation in this area it's of course by the fact that uh, from the beginning we have had a participation of big companies like uh, Brazilian side Embraer and SAP in Sweden, but also because of the intensive work of uh, CISP, which have been helping to connect the different actors. Uh, so they have been doing a lot uh, of work to make uh, the aeronautic what it is today. To also promote uh, other areas of interest, uh, the steering group of innovation was created in 2017 which had uh, four uh, defined subgroups for, for cooperation. This has been starting a little different, more top-down. We had uh, decided the areas, we didn't have like a, a, a big project going on like in the aeronautics or a little other approach here. But now we have uh, four defined sub areas of cooperation uh, and the formal cooperation is uh, between the, the two ministers. The MCT in Brazil, the Minister of Science, Technology, Information and Communication, and then the Minister of Enterprise and Innovation in Sweden. And uh, the four focus area which have been chosen are bioeconomy, smart cities, sustainable mining and uh, life science. Uh, it, it, this is the area which I think they're quite uh, global. So, uh, and they are also based uh, to a large extent on the, the former, uh, what you call co creation uh, program in Sweden, the Samvirkans program in Swedish, where we now have four new uh, co creation programs. Uh, we have formally pointed out the point of contacts on uh, both sides. In, in Brazil, we have pri primarily different units within the, the ministry MCTIC. But they have also helped from uh, four other, uh, three other ministries, like the uh, Minister of Health, the uh, Minister of uh, Energy and Mining, and the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, on the Swedish side, uh, we have project leaders from 
some of the strategic in, uh, innovation program, um, which I guess you know, and also units from RISE. Uh, the cooperation uh, between the governments do not have their own resources allocated, but uh, the idea is that we use our existing uh, uh, in, uh, what we say innovation system. We have uh, some. Um, a mechanism for public funding, and we have the connection with the funding agencies like Innova in, in Sweden and uh, EMPRAP and, and, and FINEP and so on uh, on the Brazilian side. So we will use those existing mechanisms primarily to make uh, calls, uh, bilateral calls in these areas. Um, from uh, the SIPs, um, we have the participation of uh, the bio innovation for bioeconomy, quite obviously. And then you have stream for sustainable mining. We have uh, Sri Life and uh, MedTech for Health for, for life science and uh, healthcare. Uh, so we have the two SIPs on this one because it's a very broad area. Uh, and as I said, I guess the SIPs, they do not need a further presentation. I can say very shortly, it is research agendas created since 2000 and. Uh, 12 with a call made by Innova and Formas and where there had been created some research agendas uh, between the industry and the research community based on the future needs of uh, innovation in Sweden. So here we have already uh, an, an own triple helix, you can say. Um, we do not have a SIP for the smart city, but we have uh, the, through the IVL, we have the smart city Sweden platform. Uh, where we have a, as a we has a, as a point of contact for, for the smart city and of course also a person uh, from rise um, and right now we we are we had come quite far because the point of contact have been talking to each other communication and we are trying we are starting to create actions plan with actually actions to be carried out between the two ecosystems to progress in these areas. In some cases, we have a workshop arranged and some we have actually projects going on. So um, in this context, we had also, uh, I would like to present the Sweden Brazil Innovation Initiative, also abbreviated to SBII. Uh, it is an initiative financed by uh, Vinova and uh, operated by RISE and CISP uh, with support from, from our innovation office. It's a, it's a platform and it has a, a hot site connected to the CISP homepage with the uh, information on the bilateral cooperation. And uh, we wanted to be a platform for, for meetings between the interested actors and the true ecosystem. Um, the thing is that the CISP had already done a lot of work in this bilateral cooperation in the aeronautics. So we are trying to, to learn from their experience and, and use some of their infrastructure for this. So we found it a very good solution to, to connect to their homepage in this way. I can also mention that we have, um, uh, we, we also support the EIT, uh, what the executive executive innovation team in Brazil with uh, those uh, Swedish companies where we have like Ericsson, Saab, Volvo, Scania and so on. Uh, and our activities uh, are mainly described in this next slide. Uh, you can see we, we help doing matchmaking, we arrange study visits, we have a, this a dialogue with the industry EIT and, and we have this uh, connection to the uh, CISP homepage, our hot site where you have the address here. And I can also say we have recently made a new LinkedIn page, Sweden Brazilian Innovation Initiative, which we also would use for, for um, communication information about what we, we are doing in this bilateral cooperation. Uh, I think I will stop here. It was more or less what I had to say, and we'll uh, give the work back to, uh, to Maite. And uh, I guess if you have some questions, uh, we take them later on. Thank you very much. Obrigada, Jacob. I don't know if anybody has a question. So you know that you have, I forgot to say before that we have the chat, the, the chat function. So you can, you know, make the question in the chat if they have a question for you. I have a very, very quick question for you. Why is Brazil such an interesting market for, for Sweden? Because there's so much going on, so many initiatives and, and stuff that you have presented for us. 
Uh, I, I guess historically Brazil have been very interesting. It's been a very interesting uh, country for Sweden. We have more than uh, 200 uh, companies in Sao Paulo. And I guess you say it's the second largest industry uh, city in, in, uh, in Sweden after in Gothenburg. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of activities. Uh, and then uh, there, there is a lot of uh, interesting thing going on in Brazil. They have a very strong agriculture um, sector also and, and aeronautic is also very strong so i guess there's several reasons for for brazil yeah does anybody has a question we can give you a few minutes to write it otherwise we can start with andrea's presentation but we are, we, we can wait one minute isn't it absolutely and i can i will also be here in the end i guess if exactly. somebody have a question you can also then. save the questions for for later andreas are you ready Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Very good. And uh, ah. apologize for a little bit late arrival here. Uh, I had some technical issues this morning, and that's part of Brazil. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, okay, good. I saw that you were shaking your head. So, so good yeah. morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andreas Hedde. I'm the trade commissioner for Business Sweden, for Sweden here in Brazil, based in Sao Paulo. Uh, since three years back, uh, I've been working for Business Sweden uh, for the past um, 10 years, 11 years almost now, based in Benelux before that, also responsible for, for our trade promotion activities and supporting Swedish trade. So, um, unfortunately, I had some technical uh, issues this morning, so it became all a bit stressful, but uh, I know, uh, Michelle, you will help me with the slide changing, right? So um, exactly, she will be helping you with that. We are trying to start sharing the presentation. Okay, very good. We'll see. So, yeah, we have a problem for some reason. We cannot see the whole screen. We can see only one part. Does okay. No, I think that I mean we'll just have to adapt to that. So, so uh, yeah. obviously it would have been so nice to meet you all here in Brazil and and done this presentation with you. I hope we get the chance to do a follow up, the step two later. Yeah. Uh, so let's see if the technology is with us here, uh, and well, if not, yes, uh, now it's working. Yes. You can go. Thank on. you. Thank you very much. So with me today, <clears throat> sorry, I should also say that I have my colleague. Victoria Villela, uh, who will also step in if there are any questions later on, uh, coming with answers from a Brazilian. And I think we have in the group also other people with uh, some experience from Brazil. So I'm looking forward to see this more as a, as a presentation initially, but a quicker presentation and then a, a dialogue with you and a Q&A at the end. Uh, because uh, this is a great task we've been given here to present Brazil in, let's say, 30 minutes. And uh, from the perspective of how, how you're doing business in Brazil, how is it to do business, what to consider, and what are the opportunities? Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, the agenda for today uh, will be to look at um, briefly who is Business Sweden. I'll promise to keep it short. Uh, then we have to touch briefly on the COVID-19 situation. Then you'll get an introdu introduction to Brazil from... Uh, 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 a Brazil perspective, a Swedish in Brazil perspective, and also from a business culture perspective. And at the end, I'll drop you some notes on support programs that are available for those of you considering growing business in Brazil, which I guess most of you are. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is Business Sweden. I hope and I believe most of you know who we are. Uh, very, very brief. We are uh, semi-governmental. Swedish uh, business consultancy firm. Uh, Semi-governmental means that the Swedish government is uh, partly owning us, 50%, and the other 50% is by Swedish industry. So uh, it's uh, uh, with that said, we are running according to market conditions uh, around the world, and we are based in markets where the Swedish uh, industry and Swedish government has identified the need of having a trade promotion office uh, to support Swedish industry to grow, but also to attract foreign investors to Sweden. So we work both outgoing with export, but we also work with incoming investments from foreign investors. And that is a little bit 
uh, uh, what we see today in the global trends that export and investment goes together and we need to form strategic alliances in order to prosper in the way that both parties would like to. So this is also quite significant for Brazil, uh, where, as Jakob described, we have a strategic um, uh, partnership between our countries, and uh, which is quite unique as well, I should say. So here you can say that Sweden is a little bit punching over our weight in terms of being a small country uh, acting in, in, in a big uh, uh, landscape. So going back to Business Sweden uh, briefly, you see at the bottom of this um, slide our service portfolio. So what we actually offer is uh, full service support when it comes to internationalization. We do that with uh, initial analysis of market uh, in a market expansion phase. Uh, we work operationally with sales support uh, to grow business once you're in the market. Uh, with our semi-governmental position, together with the close collaboration with the embassy and the OSI, we uh, also support with business to government uh, related matters that could be stakeholders, regulatory matters, etc. And then finally, we also support with incubation and operations. So here in Sao Paulo, we have an office in uh, uh, one of the most attractive uh, business areas in Sao Paulo, where we can host you. Uh, we can uh, represent you with legal addresses, etc., and we can help you set up legal entity when that is required. So let's go on to the next slide. That is our footprint in Americas. Um, so as you can see, I've listed the embassies on the map. You see uh, the Business Sweden offices is the blue dots, and the embassies in the region is the yellow dots. So we are complementing each other in some markets and other markets we have a, a higher representative of one or the other. Uh, I should just clarify though that we are, we are not part of the uh, embassy, but we are reporting to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So that means that we are, we are sisters and brothers, as I normally uh, uh, tell it. Uh, but we work very close together. And um, uh, our office in Brazil is located, as I said, in Sao Paulo, and we are eight people here currently. We have when um, before the crisis started in 2014-15, which I will come back to, we were uh, around 12 to 13 people. So we have had our share of the uh, economic downturn here in Brazil, like many other companies as well. But I will come back to that. Because knowing the history is, of course, also uh, a way to prepare for doing business in Brazil. So that's why I will talk a little bit about history soon. Before that, let's have a look at Team Sweden. What is Team Sweden? Uh, Jakob uh, touched upon it. So if we go to the next slide, please. This is just an overview of the actors that are operating in, in Brazil. The Swedish actors operating in Brazil are framed under, uh, in the red frame called Team Sweden Brazil. Then you have on the right hand side, Team Sweden in Sweden. And those are other authorities and agencies in Sweden that we closely collaborate with. And <clears throat> within the embassy, um, I have put also the, the, um, the science and innovation office as part of that. But as you heard from Jakob, uh, he is also uh, reporting directly to the Ministry of e Economic and Innovation. So um, embassy and business Sweden, we are representing the official Sweden in Brazil. Uh, then we have uh, two um, sister organizations here in Brazil. Uh, one is CISP. I know, I think you are all aware of CISP today. And then you have a very active and, and, and strong uh, chamber of commerce called Swedcham. So the four of us, we have uh, weekly, bi-weekly meetings to coordinate our uh, uh, initiatives and our priorities here in Brazil in order to grow the Swedish footprint and to grow Swedish business. Then we work also then closely with the uh, organizations in Sweden, again, to coordinate, to identify opportunities and to capture on them. So that's just for you to be aware of the different players in Brazil. So let's proceed to the next slide, please. This is a slide that I normally use in order to put us in the, in the landscape of when it comes to R&D and innovation. Uh, where do you find us in this uh, uh, um, uh, landscape? Well, um, we are clearly not part of actively 
working operationally with R&D activities. But then when it comes to innovation, that's where we start to see that trade promotion, commercialization and innovation goes into each other. I think you're all familiar with, with this and the TRL scale. So this is just to uh, simplify uh, a bit in where to find business Sweden in this. And as you see, I have marked in red the upper layer of the TRL scale, the eight and nine. This is my own analysis in terms of uh, finding support when it comes to financial support or operational support from the team Sweden to companies. Um, I have um, identified that this is an area where we probably can improve some. We see that now with Ignite here, the collaboration with Vinova, Ignite and, and CSP. Uh, who is uh, supporting you and and that could many, much be in the upper uh, part of the TRL scale as I have understood. And, um, and then also um, we, Business Sweden, we also when we work with our strategic partners here, the different industry companies, local companies and, and industries, uh, we uh, normally end up also in discussions on, on innovation. And, and that is, of course, a session on its own to talk about the definition of innovation and how we see that. But maybe we can take a few questions on that later. So let's proceed and really get now into Brazil. Um, I wanted to touch a bit about uh, the COVID-19 situation because it's, of course, uh, uh, playing a big role currently here in Brazil and for Swedish industry and for all industries globally as well. So if we go to the next page, please. Um, this is just to, um, uh, part of our weekly, uh, please, uh, next slide, uh, weekly report that we do on a global level uh, with um, 20 largest um, uh, countries, uh, economies in the world. And this, so this report will be launched, re refreshed today. So this is from one week back. And um, what we see with uh, the, um, the graph area is the, is the global uh, virus spread. So um, if you go to the right hand side, you will see the Brazilian numbers one week ago. I can tell you that unfortunately that number now when it comes to fatalities has almost doubled in one week. So Brazil is uh, having major issues and, and challenges when it comes to the, to the virus spread currently and is seen to become one of the new epicenters unfortunately. Um, I will not go into detail more in this slide. So if we go to the next one, please. This has significant impact on the growth all over the world. Um, as you can see of this map and later you can study it more in detail. Um, the, if we focus on Brazil, um, we see that there has, will be a, a, a economic impact uh, from uh, between five and 6% in, in negative growth this uh, year. Um, and that is moving from uh, uh, an indication of 2% growth uh, beginning of this year. We can go to the, to the next slide. I will not stop too long because I think you're all following the COVID-19 and somehow we are probably all a bit, uh, I wouldn't say uh, tired of hearing it, but uh, somehow you get a bit, uh, 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 yeah, you're losing yourself in keeping keeping also the attention to it, uh, even if it's super important. This slide, I will send it to you as well. It's more to give you an update on the different uh, uh, layers of society when it comes to COVID-19 for Brazil, uh, the um, implications it has. Uh, overall, we can say that the health, health system is very stressed at the moment. There are uh, states in Brazil that has declared uh, emergency situation and um, uh, the, it's also considered uh, whether a full lockdown should be implemented. During a part of March and April, um, we saw um, several states uh, uh, going into a sort of soft lockdown and also recommendation, strong recommendations on isolation and social distancing. So similar to other parts of the world. The only thing was that Brazil was maybe reacting a little bit slow compared to other markets in Latin America. And that's why we also now see that Brazilian runs the risk of becoming a new epicenter. This will have huge impact. We saw some, we discussed some of the economic impact uh, earlier. Um, 
and uh, it will uh, of course also have impact on the whole global value chain and supply chain and how to uh, think about uh, measures like regionalization instead of globalization etc so but i will not uh, keep longer at COVID-19, maybe go to the next slide, just uh, concluding that there are very few good news at this moment. It's uh, unemployment rates are, are, are expected to go up. It was already high before the COVID-19. And now we are looking at maybe numbers up to 15 to 20%. Um, so that will have a huge impact for Brazil going forward, as will the, uh, the stop in industry and restarting the industry. Uh, as will, of course, the fatalities and the stress it puts also on the health system. So we can go to the next slide. That with this slide, I, I just want to say that, you know, whatever prognosis that was there in January, February, um, everybody is trying to find that crystal ball now to understand how it will look. And um, all prognosis made is, of course, in, in no use when it comes to predicting the future. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, this is Business Sweden take on, uh, based much on the uh, development in China, which as you know, has starting to come out first as it entered the, the, the COVID-19 first as well. And uh, these are some takeaways that we believe uh, could be post COVID uh, realities going forward. And that is an increased competition from East, globalization, uh, we'll move to regionalization and uh, strategic uh, supply chain and autonomy will be more uh, important. Uh, we will see a new wave of, of infrastructure investment to, to catch up uh, in the societies and also uh, realizing the lack that we have seen with this uh, crisis. Uh, more from offline to online and also moving from CapEx to uh, as a service instead. So to from from CapEx to OPEX in terms of investments. More could be said about this. Uh, it's a session on its own, but we'll move on. So we come to the what you really uh, joined for, and that is, of course, more details on Brazil. Um, so moving to uh, two slides ahead, please. Um, I'm sure you have already got into the, the general Wikipedia sort of data on Brazil. So we can go to, to the next slide here. Uh, and that is maybe just a summary of, of what is Brazil in a nutshell. And it is a huge continent. Uh, it is, uh, the land mass, mass is bigger than Europe. Uh, it has over 18 cities with 1 million inhabitants. Uh, Brazil and the whole of Latin America is one of the most urbanized um, areas in the world. Uh, it has a large economy. Uh, being now the ninth biggest economy, has been moving between seven and, and, and ten the, the past uh, uh, ten years. And of course, a lot of uh, a huge population as well. So um, it has a large meaning, it has a large domestic market. Um, it is uh, historically a quite protective market. Uh, it has set up, uh, given its size, size, it has set up. Uh, uh, trade barriers and uh, and, uh, and 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 entry barriers, uh, seeing the market more as an isolated market, and and with its richness in in different natural resources, so su such as oil, gas, and minerals and agri products, that has led to some uh, uh, self sufficiency as well. So the model has has worked in a way um, with the export that it has had. Uh, but it has also formed the, the business model for Brazil being uh, producing in Brazil for Brazil. And uh, in order to, to capture the market, it has been um, important to have a local presence here. Um, <clears throat> but what Brazil has seen lately, especially the past five, six years with the economic crisis, is that it it cannot uh, no longer keep uh, the isolation uh, without hurting its own economy. And also seeing then the need of increased productivity, especially within the, 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 the industry, <clears throat> and to open up for, for global competition in order to 
also become a global player, not only in commodities, but also in more high tech. So this is, these are drivers at the moment. Then you have a political situation which complicates it, uh, not only now, but, but historically as well. Um, there has been hard to drive through a, a reform agenda and open up the market. Uh, but that is something that we now see is um, uh, moving forward. And uh, it would have been moving uh, forward quicker if the COVID-19 didn't uh, arrive. So if we go to the next slide, this is where we see um, uh, the, um, uh, in the beginning of this uh, year, uh, it was a renewed optimism in terms of, of growing the, um, the increase their productivity in the market, uh, in the country, and also to grow the, uh, the, the, the global uh, collaborations. And that was driven much from the, the reforms uh, that the current government has implemented. Um, and, and that has mainly been uh, around uh, both pension and tax reforms, which has been a very complicated and still is a complicated area for Brazil, um, but also when it comes to uh, labor reforms. So um, as you might have did see last summer, there was also um, uh, the agreement of EU Mercosur trade agreement that was initiated and agreed upon. Now it's uh, under negotiation for the details of it. And it will probably take some time before it is being fully implemented. Um, some people, some experts believe that it will take up to 10 years before it's fully implemented. But it's a very positive sign in terms of Brazil becoming more open as a market. Uh, there was also positive notes on, on increased privatization and foreign direct investments in Brazil. Uh, obviously, that has uh, uh, halted a bit now with the COVID-19 situation, um, but we hope that it will come back to, to that once the, the world is a bit back to normal again. Uh, there has also been a lot of fighting of corruptions in Brazil, uh, which has been a bit ma major issue and also one of the reasons for having these financial downturns. Uh, and overall, the market has reacted quite positively the last two years. Uh, it has started to re recover from the, the financial crisis in 15, 16, partly 17. Uh, but then, again, as we know, COVID-19 arrived, and with that, not only a financial and health crisis, but also a political crisis. Um, the media picture in Sweden, I, what I follow and see is normally not very positive to Brazil, unfortunately. And this is, of course, one of our mission to, to uh, balance the, um, the, um, the picture of Brazil. But uh, to be honest, it is a quite tough time at the moment to balance it as well. Uh, there is, uh, with these three crises in one, uh, a totally new scenario that, not, that no one has ever experienced, not even the Brazilians that are very used to handle crisis. But normally they have been handling the economic and the political crisis. And now with the health crisis on top of that, uh, let's just hope that this comes out uh, as good and smooth as possible. Uh, what we have seen uh, the last month is uh, devaluation in currency and also on the global market, uh, the commodity prices dropping, oil included. And this doesn't help Brazil uh, uh, to, to re recope. So, um, Let's hope for the best and let's try to turn it uh, now to look a little bit more on, on opportunities. Um, um, so we'll maybe go to the next slide before I'm moving into opportunities. We should, of course, touch upon the prognosis as it, as it looks now and also where Brazil is coming from. Uh, and I think that is important to be aware of uh, as you are initiating dialogues with Brazil, uh, that it has been some really, really tough years, uh, the worst economic crisis ever. Uh, but before that, as you see, uh, big, from beginning of the, of the 2000, uh, they had a very good and, and stable economy and they brought up um, a broader middle class in society uh, and um, had, had good prosperity. But then uh, the last uh, five, six years here has then uh, been a struggle. So. Um, we can go on to the next one. And much of this is uh, what, we, what is very important for you to be aware of. Um, 
and that is the cost of Brazil, uh, the cost of Brazil, the cost of doing business in Brazil, and to uh, handle Brazil as a as a as a market. Um, there are two main factors uh, pointed at for the um, crisis the past years. One is the the commodity, the global commodity prices. Um, since Brazil is very dependent on, on natural uh, uh, resources uh, in their export and trade. But uh, more, uh, and that is hard to, for Brazil uh, alone to, uh, to control. Uh, what Brazil can control is the cost of Brazil. Um, and the cost of Brazil is a term used for uh, the total um, challenge that Brazil is um, is coming with Brazil, and that is both on um, structural uh, challenges, administrative challenges, regulatory challenges, uh, and um, this uh, with with the regulatory burden, the complex tax system, um, the big um, degree of red tape and administration, together then with being a, 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 a protected country. Um, with lack in infrastructure and, and uh, driving low productivity uh, has placed Brazil very low in the World Bank's index easiness of doing business. So Brazil is currently on 124th place, uh, but the government is uh, aiming at uh, reducing that in half and, and making Brazil place it on the sixth place. But in order to do that, it will take time and it will also... Uh, require um, a lot of, of investments uh, to, to reach, the, reach that level. Um, but um, there are voices supporting this, and um, I think society overall believes that this is the path that, that Brazil needs to go. Um, but let's see, with COVID-19, unfortunately, that might also change, and maybe there are, um, uh, we will see some some backlash in this uh, strategy of opening up and making Brazil more accessible. So um, now um, we'll turn a little bit more on a positive note. I'm sorry for giving you the realistic scenario, but but um, uh, and that is maybe not the most positive uh, note. But let's see what opportunities there are and how to approach Brazil. So if we go to the next page, um, Brazil is as we said a huge land mass. And um, but to remember when approaching Brazil is that there is a, a, a geographic uh, center of the driving the economy, and that is in the southeast and the south part of Brazil, uh, where you will find um, the large cities such as São Paulo, Rio, Curitiba, um, to mention a few, Santa Catarina, também uh, also, or is the state, sorry, uh, and um, uh, they. Uh, stand for more than 70% of, of the national GDP and over 55% of the population. So this is normally where we would recommend uh, Swedish companies to, to uh, approach when, to, to, to start, uh, focus on when looking at Brazil from a geographical perspective. That doesn't mean that there are opportunities in the other parts of the country. It all depends on, of course, your industry and also um, the, um, the, the, the partnerships that you have. So let's go on, please, to the two slides ahead. And that is about Sweden in Brazil. Again, to give a little bit of an historical perspective in order to understand where we are coming from to better know where we can go. And um, Sweden is actually part of one of the, the new seven wonders in the world, the Christ statue in, 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 in um, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it was built by, um, or built off uh, Skånska Cementjuteriets um, uh, uh, supplied the cement to the Christ statue, just as a little bit of curiosity. So we can move to the next page, please. Uh, but Sweden has a very long and um, uh, uh, history with Brazil, um, much uh, with the larger uh, Swedish companies such as Ericsson, um, SQF, uh, Aga, Sia, Early, and today we see them uh, still here in the market. So it's been a market where the Swedish uh, companies has, has stayed in for long, uh, indicating that it has been also a lucrative market to do business in. Um, today we see most of the Swedish multinationals have offices and operations here. 
Uh, it, as Jakob mentioned, has been seen as one uh, as the second biggest Swedish industry city <coughs> uh, outside Sweden, uh, with um, São Paulo then being sorry, São Paulo being the second largest production city outside Sweden. Uh, whether that is uh, totally true today or not it needs to be verified, to be honest. But it is a big footprint here. Uh, and uh, a lot of production has been placed in Brazil since the business model has been to produce in Brazil for Brazil. We see, though, it's not only the larger corporations. We see a, a wave, uh, a small one, but we see a wave of more technical uh, tech companies entering uh, the market. Um, this driven by the need of, uh, of innovation and uh, increased productivity. So this is definitely uh, also uh, where I believe you see the opportunities. So it's great to, to know that there are new companies looking at Brazil and forming new partnerships. If we go to the, to the next, well, actually, we can skip the next slide. And uh, the slide after that, we go on a bit. So we get some time to talk. Please, if you can go to slide 28. And we will talk a little bit more about the culture and the um, culture aspect. So Brazil is not only one Brazil. As this, <clears throat> sorry, my voice here. As this painting, famous painting, is showing by by Tarsila do Amaral, uh, is that Brazil is a melting pot of several cultures, and that is of course based on its history as well, with. Uh, uh, the Portuguese, the French, the English, the Dutch, all being part of building up the Brazil, modern Brazil, uh, but also other emigration flows that uh, came in the in the 20th centuries were from Japan, for example, but also Italy and Spain. So um, there is not one unified identi identity in Brazil. It's uh, it's really a melt melting pot of several cultures. And looking then a bit on the culture aspect and, and doing business here, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, the header there is called family football and timekeeping um, with the uh, uh, subtitles of, of that family is very, very important in Brazil. It's the foundation of the Brazilian society. Um, and when you say family, uh, it, it's normally also seen as quite generously defined. So um, not saying that you as a neighbor to someone will become family, but it's, it's not far off from that. Social, <clears throat> and, and why is it so important? Well, I think that lays a bit in, if you compare to Sweden, you don't have the same so, uh, security, uh, social security network as we do in Sweden. So the family becomes your social security network and you care, uh, more, uh, care a lot of each other and help each other. Um, secondly, I'd like to, to bring up the social easiness that applies in, in, in Brazil. It's, um, it's a quite informal country and uh, there is an openness and easiness in, in all levels. Um, that means also that it is um, expected and recommended to always do some small talking and not be too much to the point and go uh, directly into business matters. Uh, the social aspect is super important. Um, but then when it comes to informality, there is still a very strict um, hierarchy in when it comes to uh, how companies are run and how decisions are taken. Uh, it's, um, it is the most senior person that is decided to take the decisions and will take the decisions. So it's much more hierarchical, hierarchical than in Sweden. Um, further on to get to know and learn a bit more about the Brazilians is that it's uh, Brazilians in general. Now, of course, as you understand, this is generalizing and you would still find different uh, personalities, of course, and approaches in Brazil. But um, generalizing it, uh, there, is a, uh, uh, there is a dislike for open conflicts. And, um, and uh, with that also comes the, the a genuine, genuous and continuous positive attitude to things. Uh, but that means that a yes is, is not always uh, a, a yes. It might very well be a no, but because of the positive attitude, uh, Brazilians always like to be there, like to believe in things, like to 
uh, encourage and support things uh, rather than, than uh, disliking it openly. Um, it also uh, means though that uh, when it comes to negotiations, that doesn't mean that uh, it's easy with negotiations. When it comes to, to really closing a deal, uh, be prepared for hard bargains. Overall, I would say that there is a very high level of professionalism uh, in Brazil, but there are some uh, geographical twists to it. And one of those would be this with timekeeping. Um, here in Sao Paulo, um, the economic motor engine for the whole of Brazil, um, I see no difference here compared to any Western European countries in terms of, uh, or Sweden, in terms of timekeeping and respect. Uh, but then in other parts of, of the country, you will see that the, uh, the flexibility is a little bit higher and um, that, uh, that it's not uh, always uh, uh, run in, in on time, everything. Um, if we go to the next slide on, on cultural uh, aspects, um, language is super important, uh, as is um, following and uh, uh, the red tape that uh, the country is, is having. So language-wise, uh, as you all know, uh, it's Portuguese, uh, the Bra Brazilian Portuguese is spoken here, and um, English is not very common still. Uh, I was surprised when I got here three, three years ago, I thought the English uh, would be uh, on a higher level, uh, on a broader uh, uh, base in society, but it's not. It's a few um, that speak English uh, well, and many of them you might do business with, but many of them you, you will not see uh, meet and, and expect uh, maybe that they have a higher level of, of English, but, but, but they don't. Uh, and <clears throat> this is something that you really need to invest in, um, either yourself in, within your companies or uh, through partnerships. Going back to the social part, your phone call is, is always better than an email, uh, something to, to remember. Um, that uh, going back again to the social aspect and that it is a um, um, relation-based uh, economy. Uh, and finally, uh, don't cut any corners, e um, even if you believe that it could be done. Uh, following the administri administrative and regulatory parts are extremely important in, in, in Brazil and something that we uh, strongly recommend. Um, of course, from a, from a, a, a CSR perspective, um, but also uh, 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 from a compliance perspective. And um, this, this in, include also being aware of that it comes with a high cost going back to the Costa do Brasil. So uh, if we go to the next, uh, some final uh, just reflections on doing business from, from my perspective, there's a lot more to, to, to talk about, of course, but uh, it has traditionally then been a, a, a closed market uh, where the market entry model has been to, to really be presence here in order to be successful. Uh, however, we see with the EU Mercosur trade agreement that this might be challenged going forward and also the, the path that Brazilian is indicating to take with opening up a bit more. So let's see. But for today, uh, or currently, it's still the traditional market entry model that applies, and that is uh, having a presence in order to be successful. Um, <clears throat> then uh, it is important to remember that it is a market that has also always had its bit of a roller coasting uh, uh, um, profile. So going into Brazil means staying in Brazil uh, and to have a long term perspective on that. Uh, also because of the rather high investment cost to enter the market. Uh, yeah, it needs to be put in, in a, in a, in a long-term perspective. So um, with that said, I'm just rushing quickly to the priority sectors and I will not go into details. This is something that we can discuss um, in a one-to-one -one meeting, but going to the next slide, please. Uh, these are the areas where we see great opportunities for Swedish companies in Brazil. Um, based on a good match of demand and supply from Sweden and, and the needs in Brazil. Much of it is, is, is more and more driven by uh, efficiency and productivity. Uh, digitalization is central and will only be accelerated now also with the crisis that we have uh, here and on the global level, of course. Uh, we see uh, some sectors showing 
stronger stability in the crisis, and that is the agriculture sector, the mining sector, but in a way also the retail sector when it comes to the e-commerce side, um, which is also driving tech um, technology from Sweden, like uh, fintechs, etc. So uh, going to uh, the final slide here, and that is programs on how we can support Business Sweden can support you. Um, we have uh, several different programs um, for Swedish startups and SMEs. Um, some of them are partly financed, uh, subsidized up to 50%. Uh, others are actually 100% financed. And that is the Catalyst program um, where you can uh, pitch your uh, globalization and internationalization idea. Uh, and if you are accepted, you will be given a, a, a 200,000 um, grant uh, for uh, developing your business in the selected market. So this is not Brazil uh, specific, it's for the global market. Uh, then you have also the middle, in the middle here you see the LEAP Accelerator program. That is a program where we go in and support you with developing your business plan. So this is made, done in Sweden by, by our advisors in Sweden. Um, on a regional uh, level. And um, uh, yes, this is um, my message today in terms of doing business in Brazil. I know a lot of information. Uh, I'm not going deeper into our programs. We'd be happy to follow up on that. We also have an excellent webpage that you can go in and learn a bit more about this program. And then I would welcome very much to take a one-to-one -one discussion if there are any any questions or doubts and, and needs for preparing yourself to grab the opportunities in this uh, uh, great country that Brazil is. Thank you very much. I'm noticing it's only two minutes left. I'm sorry for that. No problem. Thank you. Obrigada. De nada. I, I, could, I could relate. As a South American myself, I could relate to many of the things that you have said. We have a few questions here. So if you can take a few minutes more. I have one question from Martin from Sentian, which I think as a South, South American, it's very important. And he asks, what kind of red tape is there? Examples. Because it's not the same kind of red tape in Brazil than in Sweden. Can you yes. hear me, Andreas? <laughs> yes, the line was coming and going a bit there, actually. But you said about red, ta red tape. Exactly. Yes. So, well, it is, uh, uh, it, I mean, red tape, there are, there are various ones. And, and uh, I think you need to break it down to the different, um, uh, the different workflows in Brazil. Uh, one is, of course, the, 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 the importation and um, the, um, the Can you hear me now? Uh, no, I think I can hear you. Can you start again? Yes. Uh, so when it comes to, to the red tape, that is, uh, of course, consists of, of several uh, matters. But one that is uh, obvious is the, the tax scheme, um, the complexity in the taxes that applies in, in Brazil and how to handle that in the, smart, in the best way. Uh, from an economical perspective, but also from an administrative uh, perspective. Um, you, um, I think that is, that is one example of, 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 uh, of, of, of red tape that is, is more uh, cumbersome to handle. And the whole, uh, uh, yes, uh, as one example, I, I think we can come back to, to, to discuss more, more um, yeah, in depth on, on that. Am I, yeah. Am I we still there? We have one more question as well from GP Morgan from Sweetstep. And that's, are companies in Brazil generally conservative in terms of new technologies? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a good question. And that is something that we're always trying to, to understand ourselves, of course, as well. I would say no. I would say there is a, there is a high level of, of competence in the market already as well. Um, but uh, I think it varies uh, some from sector to sector, where we have yeah. seen then some sectors not um, being 
challenging themselves. Can, uh, yeah. I can Victoria? support you there also, yes. Thank uh, you. Yeah. So... If I agree with you, there's it varies greatly between uh, from sector to sector. There are, I mean, Brazilians as people and consumers, we are very early adopters and eager to use technology. So this goes for for the people. And then for the companies, uh, it depends on the sector, as Andrea said. So we have companies that are more uh, more leans towards uh, early adoption and others more industrial and uh, that are really in the backseat. So you have some in Brazil for automation and digitalization of processes for industrial operations is we are not at uh, walking in the pace that we should be walking. Of course, there are industries like uh, automotive and some others, the uh, aviation and things like this, that you will see a lot of uh, adoption of technology. But uh, it's very uneven from sector to sector. And I would say that if you look uh, at the industry, most of them are not, uh, are a little bit slow compared to, especially if you compare to Sweden and European countries, Northern European countries. Victoria, would you like to present yourself so they know? Yeah, I'm sorry for that. Saying... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a, so I'm Brazilian and I, I'm a business consultant at Business Sweden here uh, in Sao Paulo. And yeah. I've been working, I worked, uh, I've been with Business Sweden for a year and a half now. And I worked for financial markets for several years before. And I also uh, studied in Sweden, did my master in Sweden in Lund. So I have yeah. some connection uh, of some okay. sort. So yeah. That's great. I'm actually from. Uh, we are in the in our office in Malmo. So. so oh, you know, nice. <laughs> yeah. We have one more question here from GB Morgan. Actually, uh, GB Morgan. Yeah, exactly. I said it correctly. How are green energy products taxed in Brazil? For example, are there renewables, uh, co to neutral fuels produced from high hydrocarbon based produces and waste? Yeah. So. Uh, we don't, especially if you compare to Sweden, because I, one of the big projects that worked here is with biogas. So it relates to, to the question. And I did uh, do some digging on the Swedish structure and how Sweden uh, managed to have uh, such a big uh, amount of uh, renewables in their transport sector, for instance. So we don't have similar things here in Brazil as carbon taxes and things like that. But we recently, uh, there was a recent law. It's not so recent, but it came into force not so long ago, maybe six months or, or, or so, uh, that established that all the distributors of fuel, they will have to, to offset their emissions by purchasing bonds, green bonds. And then the, the producers of green bonds will be uh, will be able to issue these bonds and sell to the distributors that only operate or operate partially with with uh, with oil and, and the like. So we have this, but there is very new and it's starting to grow now. With Corona, everything changed a little bit, but uh, it it's seen here in Brazil as the major shift towards that, and we. To be honest, it will be hard. It was hard before because Brazil was facing uh, reforms and, uh, if I can put it that way, some sort of austerity. And that was how this government was leading things uh, in a way. So it was unlikely then, before COVID, uh, that we would have so many uh, tax benefits and this for, for, for green energy. Uh, and now I think it's even harder because the government is more squeezed and uh, it will be, and I discussed this with the federal government even, and the idea is uh, to find innovative ways to be able to finance new technology and to shift to new technologies. I, I know uh, costs are at the essence to every government around the globe for this, but uh, I believe that we will have to find this kind of solutions that you don't have the government putting money or uh, you have more a uh, private sector oriented uh, solution as this uh, with the bonds and everything. So uh, that's where I think we are heading to. 
Thank you so much. I know that Edin Kling, he, you had some questions, but we couldn't see them in the chat. Do you want to, do you want to make them? I don't know if you are there. Otherwise, I have one more question from GP, and that's Brazil's landfill agenda. Brazil's landfill yeah. agenda. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's and a major problem the here. Last one because we are like a few minutes late now. Yeah, uh, so there's a major problem here because, as uh, Andreas mentioned, we are highly, highly urbanized. So we have, I think, over 20 cities with more than 1 million inhabitants. So yeah. waste is a big issue. So, but this, uh, this, we have a lot of landfills, but even the landfills, they are becoming uh, not, uh, I mean, it was never the best solution, but now it's becoming very expensive because you don't have land to put the, the, the waste and everything. So you see a lot of initiatives and even some initiatives that uh, comes from the Nordics combined. So you have C40 and the Nordic solutions like uh, coming together with some Brazilian big cities to address this issue. So there are uh, policies in place and uh, some obligations to the, to the municipalities and state level, but now they're, they're looking to rethink the model uh, because many of the cities and states, they have to uh, reform their policies. So it, it's a good timing as well. Mm -hmm. Obrigada, Victoria. That, that's a good word that they have to learn for Wednesday's meeting. Obrigado is thank you. Obrigada if you're a girl. And well, yes. thank you also, Jakob. Thank you, Andreas. And see you, all of you, on Wednesday. Okay. Bye bye. Yes, thank you. Obrigada. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Obrigado. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tack.